It's Torah Talk. 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 We are witnesses and watchmen of Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk with Lou White and Mark Davidson. A Torah Institute podcast. Good morning, brother. Good afternoon. <laughs> How are you? Good, good. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Is it over for you now? Yes, it is. It's uh, eight, oh. eight o'clock on the day of the sun. It's tomorrow. Yes. Well, it's afternoon on the Sabbath here. So we're going to be covering repentance today. Yes. Is that right? Yes. That's good. Yeah, repentance yeah. and conviction and belief. Belief's a big bit too, big part. Yeah. Yeah. The um, belief is actually the beginning point of when people you see the adversary's been working so long to make people not believe in anything except themselves. They, you know, uh, basically worship themselves because evolution leads to humanism, which is the highest authority. And no, there is no other higher one. And of course, global government would be the authority everyone would bow to, just like Babylon, you know. So Babel is becoming stronger and stronger and stronger as we watch the pyramid being built, you know. You know, it, with the nations, each each block can represent a nation and the big building. And then at the very top, Lucifer installs himself. Hmm. You know? Wow. But uh, yeah. sincerity, though, is not necessarily a proof of belief, true belief. Because you can believe... Because, you know, even the uh, worshipers of B-A-A-L, the Lord, in Hebrew, um, they were very, very committed and sincere. They were cutting their bodies. They were so sure. But they were very wrong. Mm. You know, so sincerity is not a thing we want to measure whether or not something's true or not, you know. Because whatever our heart goes after, or, our, you know, our desires go after, uh, we're going to follow it. You know, with fondness and commitment, and uh, people have died for for uh, living error. You know. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but repentance is. Uh, there's actually three words. One of them is Greek, and two of them are Hebrew, and they basically all talk about the idea and the action. So because you've got a concrete and then you've got an abstract understanding. And uh, the Greek word that we most often see in the scriptures for repentance is metaneo, metanoio. Yeah. And it, uh, meta, this is one of our, uh, what do you call these? Flashcards. Meta means to change. And noio means to comprehend something. So like gnosis or knowledge. And uh, so you're changing what you're thinking, you know. And the Hebrew word is actually most often um, probably nakam, but it, it also means the same general thing as teshuba, which is shortened to shub, shub. In other words, that's the idea of turning around and changing one's mind. And actually what we understand from Shaul and the other writers of the brief how to cut a shot is that we're to re renovate our minds, renovate them, you know, to renew them, renew them. And that would be the programming that we were supposed to turn back to. Now imagine this. I want to read this scripture to you because it's in Acts chapter two. Anyway, therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that Elohim has made this Yahusha whom you impaled, 
both master and messiah. Having heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Kepha and the rest of the emissaries, men, brothers, what shall we do? So what is it that he, they were told to do? It says, and Kepha said to them, repent and let each one of you be immersed in the name of Yahushua Messiah for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the set-apart spirit. For the promise is to you and your children, and to all who are far off, as many as Yahuwah our Elohim shall call. Now that was an interesting thing, because what are they to repent and go back to? Are they to go back to Christmas and Sunday, and or just have nothing at all to follow? Or are they to obey the covenant? You know, that's the question. So, you know, are they supposed to get, go get set up underneath a pope and, and a priesthood that dispenses seven sacraments that are never mentioned anywhere in the scriptures? Is that what they're to repent to? Or are they to turn back and look at the covenant again, like they did in the days of Nehemiah? And hearing the words, they'd stand up for hours and listen to the Torah, the instructions, and go, wow, this is what we're supposed to do. And it's the same thing over and over. And uh, Christians are not hearing this. No. Yeah. No. Very sad, isn't it? It's, uh... Yeah, it's a deception. And it's, uh, it's like a worldwide plan to just give somebody the wrong thing to do, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, if we're to renew our minds, you know, um, we have to have a willingness to obey first. And that's kind of a prerequisite. So we have to, before we can even repent, we have to be willing to hear the truth, you know. Mm -hmm. And then when we're convicted that the truth is that Yahuwah exists, and that we are to diligently seek him and to find out what it is that he wants us to do, uh, to do his, to walk before him as he would have us live. That's righteousness, you know, his righteousness, not the righteousness of men. Uh, not that man can ever change any of those laws or instructions. They're, they're, they're really ways, a way of life, you know. And the Torah, the Ten Commandments, we were told to not depart from them and not let them depart from our lips. We're to teach them diligently to our children and our grandchildren and, and be careful to walk in that covenant. But uh, anyway, the renewing of your mind, I've, I've, I've written this down on a flashcard. The renewing of your mind is a renovation of your, of your thinking. And it isn't your thoughts anymore. It's, it's because you've received the spirit. And he indwells you, the spirit of Yahusha comes to live in you. And then he renews your mind, not with some strange ideas that, of right and wrong that you decide, but he's defined right and wrong. And uh, Romans 12, too, is where that is discussed. But actually, all of t Romans 12 is the whole, the whole chapter discusses how we are to walk, you know, not judging one another, you know, but mm -hmm. uh, to keep our eyes on him, because we're not supposed to look at each other, you know, in the sense of, well, you're doing it that way, so I need to do it that way, uh, because I think that's right. Or you decide what, what you want to do. But we don't want to do what's right in our own eyes, you know. Mm. Yeah. Dealing with what's right and wrong, and how he's already laid out for us what is right and wrong. He's defined what sin is by his covenant, by his commandments. And if we break them, we need to repent and turn around. Um, there were um, there was a, a great. Uh, now that we've dealt with the name and the covenant, I think people need to understand how to bring all that into when you're talking to somebody, because um, they're like most people are like, well, what are you what are you telling me this for? There's nothing wrong with me. I'm cool. I, I haven't done anything wrong. I I try and do unto others, and you know like. I, most people say things like that, um, and there was this uh, article I mentioned in the back of the uh, Kazayon, Kazayon brothers and sisters. You can get it from TorahZone.net from our brother um, Todd Efren. Todd Efren, yeah, Todd Efren, and he's got this article at the back which was amazing. Um, 
and he's taken he's uh, used parts of an article from um, Hell's Best Kept Secret by Ray Comfort, and uh, he goes into uh, basically bringing the Ten Commandments or the Torah mm -hmm. or the law to somebody to let them know that yes you you are not okay there are there are laws and you've broken them because if you just come to them with with a message or intellectual knowledge you can have a lovely intellectual conversation and walk away and they feel great and you might feel okay but there's no real conviction because they don't they haven't been hit with the covenant they haven't been hit with you who is law or you who is instructions to see that oh I, I haven't been doing those things. So he's saying basically in this article that any kind of witnessing should always have the Ten Commandments uh, or, or basically Yahuwah's instructions in it as the, as the core part of it because otherwise there's no real genuine conviction of sin and repentance. Yes, and what was that example he gave there at the very end of that uh, essay? Yeah, he talks about a, a, uh, two blokes who are on a, um, a plane. And he says a lot of people these days are being taught to come into Yahusha or religion or JSUS for the purpose of life enhancement. If you come into this, your life will be full of love, joy, peace and fulfillment and lasting happiness. And he said that's not the attitude you should have when you come into um, Yahusha. Um, and the two men on the parachute, uh, one man is told to put on a parachute because it will make his flight a lot more enjoyable. And uh, the other man is told that he has to put on this parachute because the plane's going to crash and he has to jump out and it's the only thing that will save his life. So the two men have a very different attitude during the flight. Um, and he talks about one man who's who the waitress spills coffee on, on the first man's on lap accidentally and he's just oh this stupid parachute and he takes it off and you know you, this was supposed to make my flight better and so he gets rid of the parachute and so he's basically saying there that uh, there, there wasn't any real genuine repentance he was just sort of he'd done things wrong and he'd been convinced to come along to, to circus to religion whereas the second guy he doesn't care what happens if the if you know the coffee spills on his leg he, he uh, it might hurt but he doesn't um, take off the parachute because the parachute's the only thing that's saving his life. So, and he's basically saying that that's that's uh, the Yahusha. That's our relationship with Yahusha. Um, the parachute. The, the parachute, parachute represents Yahusha. Yeah. Yeah. To put him. Yeah. Mm. And so there's yeah. two very different attitudes during the flight during our life. If we, and so we don't come into this experience because. Uh, you know, and we shouldn't be teaching people to, and coaxing them. Come on in; it's wonderful. It's, you know, you'll feel amazing, and you know, yeah, and you might, you might at times, but it's uh, and you do inside. But the main part is, come into this because, you know, there's a lake of fire, and and the world's going to end soon. It's going to be burnt up. You know, it's they need to be told the truth so that there's real conviction and real yes. repentance. So and, and I think the, I think one of the main points too is that we have joy, even in this, in spite of the turmoil and the tri and the trials. Hmm. Because you know we can get coffee spilled on us with with Yahusha's par parachute on, and we don't mind. It's hmm. just we never hmm. expected the flight to be good. It's going to crash, and uh, why would we expect the parachute is going to make our flight enjoyable? Our joy comes from the fact that we have the parachute on, and that we know that we'll be safe. Hmm. And our life will be saved. Yeah, that's a wonderful uh, essay that shows the, you know, a modern interpretation of what uh, our trust is really in, and how we and our expectations can be off if we're not told the truth. You know, the truth is the covenant, and they're shunning the covenant, pushing it away, and saying that was nailed to the to the crooks, and that's far from the truth. It's it's the it's the the instructions that we're to live in. But uh, they're taught error, and so the people are wondering why they're getting all this trouble. Well, the uh, we're going to have troubles anyway. I mean, you know, because we, but we're not worried about it. We have joy, true joy, because we know that we know Him. You know. But anyway, Romans two or Romans twelve verse two, it says, "And do not be conformed to this world, 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you prove what is that good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of Elohim. So we know when we're given the commandments. So we can repent when we hear the commandments and we know, I've broken every single one of these. You know, even the one about murder, because if anyone's hating their brother in their heart, because, you know, the one that, actually it's, it's a true fact that you're the slave of the one that you hate. Because it's all you can do. It consumes you. It's, it's just a terrible thing. It's enslavement. Uh, so hate is not a part of what we are programmed with. We're taught to love one another, even our enemies. So love is the objective of all ten of the commandments. Every one of them. But they aren't taught the commandments. They're taught to, oh, stay away from those commandments. And that Mark and that Luna, they're trying to teach you those. You know, and they are wonderful. You know, they, they're the mind of Messiah, you know. He's the walking Torah, the, the Word, you know. So we have a willingness to obey when we hear the commandments and we decide whether or not we like them or not and say, well, wait a minute, why do I like these? Well, he's giving you the ability to love the truth, which, is a, which are those ten words. Yeah. And when he gives you the ability to love them, then he comes into you because it says in Acts 5.32 that if, if it says, and so is the Ruach HaKadosh whom Elohim has given to those who obey him. So when we obey him, even, the, you know, the example of the parable where the two sons, there was a man who had two sons. And one son was told, was asked by his father, please go out there and do this and that. And the son said, uh, no, I don't think I, I'm going to be able to do that today. And then the other son, he said, you know, go do this. And he said, uh, I will. I'll do that, father. And the one, the first son that said he would not do it was convicted later. And he said, well, I know what my father's will is. So I'm just going to go ahead and do it. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. And the second son that said, I'll obey that. Wow. I'll obey that. But, I, but then he goes and not, and he doesn't do it. Well, that's a perfect example. And um, so we have those two sons. One, one obeyed the will of his father. So he knew what the will of the father was. And Yehuda has given us his will. He said it is a way up in Shamayim or heaven or far across an ocean or something. It's right here. It's been here all along. Anybody can find my will. And so you find out what his will is. And then you make up your mind to obey his will. And then he will enable you to do it. Because he gives you his spirit. Yahushua comes into you. And he gives you his point of view. And he goes, oh, I see. And then you share his point of view instead of yours. And that's the change. Man, that's an amazing. Because the willingness to obey is a prerequisite to receiving his name and his covenant. You know, that's what we as Nazarene are doing. The Nazarene do that. We guard and teach and watch carefully over his name and his covenant. And uh, we're much different from the, the Christians who have been taught the errant ideas, who follow a different way. They have another way. They do things that were adopted from paganism, you know, which we all often pointed out. Not that we're judging them, but we are shining a bright light of the Torah on those things. You know, the wreaths and the crosses and the, and the Christmas and the bunny rabbit festivals and the Sunday. Where is it written where we're supposed to rest on Sunday? Well, we're supposed to rest on the seventh day of the week. Not any seven days, but the week. You know, the heartbeat. But... Uh, Speaking of um, parables, you mentioned uh, in our last unrecorded recording that uh, that uh, Yahusha is very very excited about uh, when one of his children repents um, and you were talking about the parable of the uh, of the prodigal son you're talking about the prodigal son and you, you said uh, something to the effect of Yahua doesn't see himself Yahua has never seen himself as being in a hurry but uh, you can finish it. I remember we were discussing when the father ran, 
Yehuda doesn't seem to be in a hurry for anything. He's very patient, and he just waits on us. And but there was a parable that Yehusha gave at Luke 15, and I and I want to focus on verses 17 through 24. And anyway, what happened in the parable was there were two sons, uh, and they represent, as we understand it, the uh, two houses of Israel. The the house of Yehuda which was in the north, the southern part of the land, and the house of Israel, which were the ten tribes. And the younger son, which is the northern tribes that broke away from the whole of Israel, uh, they were the younger son, and the Assyrians carried them into the nations. Well, that's another story, but that's what this is really about, we believe. The prodigal son was wasteful. That's what the word prodigal means. He wasted his fortune, which is actually the covenant. And he abandoned it, and he went away from his father's household. He asked his father to give him his inheritance, and then he would go off and, and be by himself, outside the father's household. And while he was away, it, it, he used up all of the father's wealth that he had given him as his inheritance, as the younger son, and, uh, and was found penniless, and then a famine struck that faraway land, and he found himself having to hire himself out as a servant in uh, that land. And he was feeding pigs, which is, I think, a metaphor for practicing false religion. And, uh, you know, because it's an unclean thing. And he's seeing these pigs getting fed better than he does. He's getting very little food. And he's starving. And then he comes to his senses. And that is an awakening. That's when he wakes up to who he is. And that's, that's not this one son. This is all of the children of Israel that were scattered into the nations. And this, one, this son, all these sons and daughters, awaken to who they are, their identity. And then they say, wait a minute. I can go back to my father's household and return to his household, meaning he obey his covenant, and maybe he'll receive me as a servant. Maybe I can be a janitor or serve him in some way, rather than be called his son. So he does this. But here he is. But having come to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have, been, have bread enough to spare? And I am perishing with hunger. In other words, he doesn't have the, the word of life, the covenant. Having risen... I shall go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against the heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And having risen, he went to his father. In other words, he got up and started walking. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The father ran. When you repent, it really gets his attention. And the father in this parable is the father, you know, the creator. Mm -hmm. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against the heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. The guy was barefoot, you know, and dirty. He'd been away. And, but the father ran. And that's telling us that he's, he's loving that, you know, when you repent. It doesn't matter what you've done. You can renew your mind and you become a new creation. But Revelation 3 even talks about this. Uh, I believe it's to the uh, assembly of the Laodiceans. As many as I love, I reprove and discipline. So be ardent and repent, you know. So if you feel the pressure and, you know, you want it to be all right, then just find a way to, to, to just do his will. And, of course, you're going to be not punished by him then. You'll be punished by the dragon. But you have to expect that persecution. But it's right there in front of all of us, and it's been there all along. But what are they supposed to repent to? Are they supposed to turn back and keep Sunday? Are, uh, put up Christmas trees and ornaments and wreaths on their doors? And are they supposed to listen and go to a priest and receive sacraments? 
Is that what he said? Is that repenting for an Israelite? See, because when they were talking, when Yahushua was talking to people, and when his disciples later, like in Acts chapter 2, and they were Israelites gathered from all over the world. He wasn't saying, whatever you find them doing in these other nations, go ahead and do that now, but don't think of the pagan deities. Think of Yahuwah instead, but just keep doing those things. He said, stop it, you know, because they they were seeing some horrible things there. Uh, like in uh, the city, when Paul went to the uh, main city in Greece, A-T-H-E-N, -E -E, well, it was A-T-H-E-N-S. Um, anyway, <laughs> Some people don't know why we spell these things. He was he was talking to the philosophers, and you know, I'm going to try to find that too. I think there's an interesting thing that's discussed there. Acts 17. Uh, the whole chapter is amazing. Uh, Paul exhorts these philosophers in Acts chapter 17, and starting in verse 30, it says, "Truly, then, having overlooked these times of ignorance, Elohim now." commands all men everywhere to repent because he has set a day on which he is going to judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, having given proof of this to all by raising him from the dead. Now that's, you know who that is. It's Yahushua. So that's pretty serious. So it isn't just like the Christians have been saying, well, we don't have to obey that because that's Jewish. What? You have to engraft into the nation of Israel and become a covenant-keeping individual and an Israelite. You know, you, you're, you, 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 you become a, um, a former Gentile, but you're not going to remain a Gentile. There's nobody that's in the covenant that's still a Gentile, you know. That's one of the misnomers, too. You know, the Messianic groups sometimes teach that, are you Jewish? Are you an actual Messianic? Or are you a Gentile? <laughs> Even though they keep the commandments, they say, no, I'm a Gentile. I was born that way. Now, the, the seed of Abraham is in the nations, and we're appealing to the scattered tribes, those that were raised in generations and generations of the wrong things, you know. So repentance is to find out what it is, what it is his, what is his perfect will, and then to turn back to that will, just like the prodigal son, and he will run to you. Hmm. So uh, in, in informing people that they need to be engrafted into Israel, you'd also let them know that what they see in Palestine and on the news and things, that's not the Israel we're talking about, is it? That's just a worldly nation. That's a government. That's not the government of Yahuwah. The government of Yahuwah is the, is the Torah. You know, and it reigns in men's hearts. He said it will not be something that you can go and say, oh, look, there it is. There's the kingdom or the reign. He said it would be in you, you know, and that's the thing. It's a renovation. It's a transformation of an individual. You've got to make it personal. And now... Uh, in Acts 5.32, it says, We are his witnesses to these matters. So also is the set-apart spirit whom Elohim has given to those who obey him. And it says in 1 John 3.24, And the one guarding his commands stays in him and he in him. And by this we know that he stays in us by the spirit which he gave us. He wants us to obey his covenant, and when we do, we start obeying, he gives us an enabling power to love it and to go, I see it from your perspective now, not mine. That's the mind of the flesh as opposed to the mind of the spirit, see? So the mind of the spirit gives you a new viewpoint, and you go, I love this, and you, and you want to obey his commands. But you see, the spirit of error is trying to make people stay away from that. But just take your first step in obedience, not even understanding it, and he will run to you, and that meaning he will come into you and enable you. So repentance, it gets his attention. You know, there's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. And if you want to see Yahuwah run, just obey his commandments. You know, mm -hmm. test him. Test him. He wants you to test him. And that would mean, by renovation, you would be constantly 
at work renovating all the time. You don't just uh, repent to sneak in the doorway and then do what you want. You constantly, whenever you read the Torah, it's just like standing in front of a big mirror, isn't it? Let me, you mentioned that something amazing there. That's what Yaakov, uh, James, his half-brother, Yahushua said, therefore put away all filthiness and overflow of evil and receive with meekness the implanted word. That's the Ten Commandments, which is able to save your lives and become doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. See, that's the difference between the Greek mindset and the Hebrew mindset, is to hear and obey, not just hear. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. He's looking at the law. And he looks at himself and he, and he goes away and immediately forgets what he was like. But he that has looked into the perfect Torah, that of freedom, and continues in it, not become a hearer that forgets, but a doer of work, that one is blessed in his doing of the Torah. Now the word freedom, the word freedom is, is the Greek word Eleutheria, and it means legitimacy. In other words, that of legitimacy. You, the perfect Torah is legitimate. You know, it doesn't mean you're free. It means it's instructing you in righteousness. So when uh, when you're talking to Christians and they like to bring up John three sixteen and say, you know, for you who are so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes, and they they say, well, I'm not going to perish because I believe. It's all I need to do, believe. You're saying that the Hebrew word for belief is very different to the Greek view of belief. Is that what you were saying? Oh, absolutely. You know, the Greek idea of belief is a thought process. You can believe something, but not do it. You know, just believe that he is for righteousness only. And that is true. But the man who practices the truth, he is also righteous when you're enabled to obey because of his indwelling. So, see, he writes his covenant upon your heart so that you love it. That's what Yahu or Jeremiah 31 is talking about. And Hebrews chapter 8, I believe it is, and chapter 10 both, quote that as the renewed covenant. It's not like it's going to be different. It's the same covenant. It's just a renewal of the same covenant. And, uh, you know, the house of Yehuda and the house of Israel are going to be, become one, and they're going to reunite, and they're going to be under that same headship, you know, one body, keeping the same laws, you know, the same covenant. And so you can't go through this process, um, and like, that's what we were like, you, you're sorry, but you, you've realized you didn't have the power, and you're sinful, and you fail, so during the week, you're basically stumbling all the time, but then when you get to the weekend, you go back to the circus, and you... You feel high again, or if you're a Catholic, you get forgiven again, or you know, and you put it all at the cross, and you know, and you start your week again fully. Your battery's recharged, but um, it's very different now. I found, and I'll say to people, look, this is this isn't just a thought process. This, unless you've been immersed, which we'll you know deal with next episode. Well, it's um, you don't have the power to overcome anything. You can't just do all it, try and do all this in yourself. You have to be immersed and get him within you to start throwing out all the stuff that he doesn't like and, and changing you. Is That's the process, isn't it? Yes, he gives you his point of view so that you don't see the way you used to see it. You remember what you used to think, but you go, wow, that was dirty. That was nasty. That was ugly. Why was I like that? You know, why did I not see his way? But when he gives you his life then you see exactly what it is that he sees. And uh, Psalm 119, verse 59, says, I have thought about my ways, and I have turned my feet to your witnesses. And those, the word turned there is the Hebrew word shub, repent. And witnesses happens to be his testimonies, his, his, the things that he's expressed that are his thoughts and his ways and his his path. And of course the Ten Commandments are his his testimonies. You know? So it's a wonderful thing to know that and, and to realize it. Now, he also said that we would be condemned by our own words. And I always thought that was a very interesting thing. 
Um, some of us don't have the problem of using bad language, or uh, but he means by that mostly expressing unbelief, you know, with our words. Uh, Matthew 12, starting around verse 33 says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree rotten and its fruit rotten. He's talking about identifying a tree by the fruit that you see on it. A tree is known by its fruit. You brood of adders, how, do you, how are you able to speak that what is good, being wicked? For the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. The good man brings forth what is good from the good treasures of his, of his heart. And the wicked man brings forth what is wicked from the wicked treasure. And I say to you that for every idle word men speak, they shall give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be declared righteous, and by your words you shall be declared unrighteous. Now that should frighten everyone, you know. Scare them, scare them straight, you know. We have to be careful. So it's always best to err on the side of obedience instead of disobedience, you know. And say, well, if that law was nailed to the tree, or uh, we don't have to do that, that's Jewish. Well, why don't you just go ahead and do it and see what happens? Because there's things that you learn by walking in his ways. He'll give you his perspective. Because right now, being outside in the, in the darkness, you aren't able to see what the light has to teach you. you know? You're never going to get in trouble at the end for being too obedient, are you? Oh, that's really a funny situation, isn't it? Can you imagine standing before the judgment seat of Yahushua and him, or the throne of Yahuwah, and he's saying, well, I sent all these messengers out to you, all these pastors, and they told you not to keep those commandments, and you did anyway. What are you? Are you a moron? <laughs> Away from me, <laughs> you who practice law lawlessness. Wait a minute. He wouldn't do that. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. You know, these people that are being tricked, into all these nonsensical things. And we just need to wake them up. I think if we can just get them angry about it, enough to go search it out and prove that we're wrong, maybe they'll wake up. if they, Because, you know, that's what awakens us from our sleep a lot of times. We get scared in a dream, and we it wakes us up. Or we get angry and, and, or in a dream, and you'll wake up, you know. So an awakening has to happen one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So the people that are walking around on the earth, are in, it's like they're in a dream, a matrix of error. And, and we're here to just walk around in them and give them a little spark of life and try to snap them out of it, give them an electric shock. <laughs> and maybe, you know, they'll go, no, you're trying to disturb my sleep here. I was so happy. And they're comfortable in their little blanket of comfort. You know, they feel like, well, everybody's over here doing this. How could they all be wrong? And you're the only one that's right. You know, but it's not us that's right. It's the it's the truth that's right. And that's the authority. We're no authority. The only authority that we have is we're weak. We have we're, All we can do is speak his words, and that's where the power is. The real power is in the commandments. When you speak the commandments, you know, Amazing. So the last bit, he basically ends this article in the back of uh, Kizayon by saying that we need to lay the weight of the Torah upon people to prepare their hearts for Kassid. What would you say Kassid is? Would that be what the Christians say, grace? Or? Yes, it is. Uh, Hasid is a uh, Hebrew word. The Hasidim are the righteous ones. The pious ones, someone who is pious, and uh, Hasid is uh, loving kindness in spite of ourselves. So, while we were guilty and sin and sinful, Yahuwah loved us and gave Himself for us. And so, I mean, you know, Yahushua actually is the perpetuation for all of our transgressions, past, present, and future. But uh, a lot of the things that we do are in ignorance. and But, you know, he knows that we seek his will. And so even while we're on the path, we're in the race, and we shouldn't be chiding each other and being 
critical and judgmental. Hey, you're wrong. You're doing it this way. Even if the people have a little different pronunciation of the name, then we're not to be critical of them, but we're to help them and guide them and inform them that, you know, there are other people that think differently, but you have to love them, you know. Uh, Proverbs 7 says, My son, guard my words and treasure up my commands with you. Guard my commands and live, and my Torah as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers and write them on the tablet of your heart. Mm. Yeah. And uh, when you learn the commandments, they can say legalism, legalism, legalism all day long. But, you know, when you're standing before the throne, it's better to be there as a legalist than as someone who's accused of lawlessness. Mm. And and that's the thing that maybe it will break someone's, you know, thinking. Crack it open and go, well, yeah, wouldn't it be better to, to obey? Because to obey is better than to sacrifice, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, how, when did that change, you know? And why would it ever change? Um, he's not given any man the authority to change any of his laws. What he's made straight, no one can bend. So if we're not walking in feelings, I mean, that's how we used to get people in years ago. My brother-in-law, who's now an under-pastor, he said years ago, he said, oh, the thing that affected me most, Mark, was when you said, talk to me about his love is intoxicating, you know, uh, and all the world's trying to offer up all this intoxicating things, but his love is intoxicating, which is true, but, you know, he's now deceived because I didn't lay the weight of the Torah because I didn't know it myself on his shoulders. And, and at the end of this thing, he's saying it's like, Doing that sort of thing, uh, prancing around about, you know, dealing with people's feelings is like going fishing without a hook. Uh, you got your bait on there, which is how you love people and talk to people and bring up topics and get some kind of conversation going. But when they chew through that, if there's no hook, which is the Torah, then yeah. you're not going to catch a fish. And that's what we're out there to do, catch fish. Well, so, you know, Speaking of fishermen, you know, we are fishermen, and uh, it, it leads right up to that point. In Matthew 5, he says, Don't think that I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to complete. For truly I say to you, till the heaven and the earth pass away, one yod or one tittle shall by no means pass from the Torah till all be done. Whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches men so shall be called least in the reign of the heavens, but whoever does and teaches them, he shall be great in the reign of the heavens. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall by no means enter into the reign of the heavens. And what is the reign of the heavens? Well, the reign of the heavens is actually the reign of Yahu Yahusha himself. Matthew 3 talks about it. In those days, Yahuqan and the Immerser came proclaiming in the wilderness of Yehuda, saying, Repent, for the reign of the heavens has come near. For this is he who is spoken of by the prophet Yeshayahu, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of Yahuwah, make his path straight. So that's saying, too, that Yahusha is Yahuwah. Prepare the way of Yahuwah. You know, after his immersion and 40 days of fasting, Yahushua went away from Yahukanan. And from that time, Yahushua began to proclaim and to say, Repent, for the reign of the heavens is drawn near. That's the same thing that Yahukanan had been saying. And then he said, Walking by the Sea of Galil, he saw two brothers, Shimon and Kepha. No, Shimon called Kepha, excuse me, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I shall make you fishers of men. And what is the hook? Well, the hook is the Torah, the Ten Commandments. We read them at the beginning of every one of our seminars. You know, So if we read the, the commandments, and he said, do not think that I came to destroy the Torah. Now, you, want to, you want to read them real quick then? Yeah. Definitely. Here's the retelling. And for the scattered tribes of Israel, and in Deuteronomy 4, he said, you're not going to, Moshe is speaking to the people. He says, you're going to, you're going to not obey. You're going to get scattered. 
and the scattering of you is going to occur. Then in the last days, all these words are going to come upon you. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage. You have no other mighty ones against my face. Number two, you do not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness which, which is in the heavens above or which is in the earth beneath or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. Number three, you do not nasa or cast the name of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to ruin. For Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who casts his name to ruin. Number four, guard the Sabbath day, the Sabbath day, and set it apart as Yahuwah, your Elohim, commanded you. Six days you labor and shall do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahuwah your Elohim. You do not do any work. You nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and that Yahuwah your Elohim brought you out from there by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahuwah, your Elohim, commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Now, look at this. The covenant sign is the Sabbath day, Ezekiel chapter 20. And number five says, respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah, your Elohim, has commanded you, so that your days are prolonged and so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah, your Elohim, is giving you. Number six, you do not murder. Number seven, you do not break wedlock. Number eight, you do not steal. Number nine, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Number 10, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. Now that's the hook, and we've got to fish with that hook. Mm. <laughs> that's a wonderful thing. My. And uh, so if you lay the weight of the Torah on people's shoulders, he was saying that uh, there's no room for self-righteousness there. There's no, nobody can stand up and say, I'm okay. Because at the beginning he says something like, you come and say, say to somebody, oh, I just paid your speeding fine today. They said, I never had a speeding fine. You know, so they're not happy with what you've said. They're not thankful. They're not grateful. They're actually insulted because you're telling them they've done something wrong. And they don't think they have. Whereas if you give them the Torah and say, well, have you ever stealed before? Well, do you do the Sabbath? Correct Sabbath? You know? Um, and there's ten of them. Ever, ever wanted something that's not yours? <laughs> you know? Got angry at somebody because they got something that you wanted? It's uh, Nobody can stand up and say in self-righteousness that I'm okay when you put the weight of the Torah on them because it's... Well, the scriptures that say the whole point of the Torah is nobody can keep them, can Is there something like that? Nobody can keep the Torah? That's why Yahushua came? Yeah, it says basically that uh, the heart, the mind of the flesh is unable to obey. It will not submit to the Torah of Yahuwah. Mm -hmm. But the mind of the spirit is enabling you to do so. Mm -hmm. So uh, without his indwelling love and presence, and your willingness to submit to him and his will, put him on your throne in your heart and, and give yourself up. In other words, sacrifice yourself. Offer yourself as a living offering that is, that is what he wants you to do. And then you submit to him and he takes control of you. And he might send you to, some, to do some bad things. Not, not bad in his sight, but things that other people will look at. Because he was accused of going to sinners and working among sinners and being accused of being a glutton and a wine-bibber, which is a drunkard, and hanging around with people who were lawless and people that were sinful, uh, harlots, uh, prostitutes, uh, tax gatherers, thieves, uh, murderers, all those people that he was around. But he was a light for them. And he was 
he 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 looked indistinguishable from them from a, from an outsider's point of view. But what he was doing in there with them was, I think, two things, and that is he was working on them, but he was also judging the hearts of those who were judging them, judging the lawless as if they're better. You know, I mean, we're no better than a murderer or a thief if 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 our hearts judge them because we're judging the Torah, you know, and we become, we put ourselves above Torah, you know, mm. and uh, we, we have to love one another and, and look at the lost as, as broken people, <clears throat> because the Nazarene are a group of broken people, you know, and uh, the people that are outside our faith, what hope do they have if we are not commissioned to go and teach them the name and the Torah? You know, we're commissioned, that's our commission. He said, go and teach all the nations everything that I commanded you to obey. And uh, who were, who was he speaking to? He wasn't speaking to any Catholics or Pentecostals or Baptists. He was talking to uh, Nazarene, not Israel, you know. Israel was commanded to obey a certain thing, and that was the mind of Yahuwah given in, the, in that covenant we just read. And when we expose them to that hook that we're fishing with, then we can pierce their hearts and they can say, I've, I've not kept these. And that's his perfect will. I want to keep them. That he will run to you. And he'll, he'll embrace you. You know, and it's going to be great. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you'll have what we have. Mm -hmm. You know, a love for his covenant. Mm -hmm. Has anybody ever in a Christian assembly ever came up and said, I don't know what it is. I just, I just love these commandments. <laughs> That, that doesn't happen. They don't even talk about the commandments, you know, the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. If they read them, then they would understand them, and they would be convicted, and then they could repent. You have to be convicted of sin, of the fact that you've transgressed. And don't say that I can keep doing that transgressions because I believe in, in the existence of someone that gave his life for my sins. That's not the full picture, see? Your, your sins are covered by the blood of Messiah. That's correct. But we have to turn away from sin. Repent. Otherwise, you'll perish. Even if you do. See, the demons believe. Yeah. But they will not obey. Mm. They will not. So it's not up, it's not up to us to, to judge people and say, oh, well, you're not going to make it and you're not saved. And, you know, because... Yahushua's heart, you know, there might be some that slip in the back door because of, the, of their fruit. But the point is, why would you want to be just barely, maybe I'll make it, maybe I won't. The point is to try and, and, and win. <laughs> it's a race. The point is not to try and come last. The point is to try and win, you know. And yeah. so I think people need to understand that when they do come through this doorway and we've we're talking about the doorway into the kingdom here. After that happens, because of the, the, the cleansing process, which probably goes on forever, it's easy to feel, uh, you start looking inward at yourself, start looking in at yourself and getting depressed and, uh, you know, feeling like a hypocrite probably at times. Like, And I've said to people, look, if we waited until we had it all perfect before, like we did a show like this or did anything, we'd, yeah. never, we'd never do anything because... It's easy for me to walk away and go, oh, kids, and there's chaotic times, and there's angers, and there's dramas, and, and then you have to sit here and look like you've got it all together. We don't have it together. It's our, oh. lives. our lives are nuts. We're all going through a process. Yeah. Um, but pe when we're talking about belief, people need to believe that they have been washed clean. There's no point lingering, and even, yeah. even though we're not Catholic and we don't do that whole penance thing, people often, even Nazarene, walk around... And they're taking on weird behaviors or weird practices just to pay penance, you know, like for their sins. You don't have to do that. It's gone. You know, we don't trust in our obedience to the covenant for our salvation. You know, that's not it. Uh, because we understand that's his, his thoughts. The thoughts of Yahuwah become our thoughts when we keep these commandments. And that revelation of his mind in us gives us a completely renewed mind. And we don't have any will to disobey. It's gone. Yeah. It's been a pleasure talking to you, brother. Oh, and great. I haven't seen you for a week and a half, and I've been missing. <laughs>
<laughs> you know, they, we really work well together. And uh, it's because of the same spirit in us. Uh, we have the same heart. We and Neither one of us feels like we're worthy and we don't have any uh, business doing what we're doing. But, uh, yeah. you know, it's just to him and let him work through us, you know. And I think that's what it really is, is the same spirit is working in both of us. And we don't think we're superior to, to other people. You know, it's just, we're just uh, desperate sinners just trying to please him, you know. And that's all we're trying to do. Yeah. So true. <laughs> yeah. Love you, mate. Love you. All right. Love you. Love bye bye. You, bye bye. You know, he sets up his government and he's going to choose Jerusalem. His name has been placed there forever. That's why we were talking about facing Jerusalem when we pray. Yeah. And you were talking about where is it, you know? Yeah. Relative to you, let me let me see. I, I don't think I gave you the right directions on that. Yes. This is where you are, brothers and sisters. A couple of weeks ago, we had an, an episode that didn't record properly, so we, we still have some lingering. Forgotten most of it, but we still have some lingering thoughts. And Lou pulled out his globe last last time. Here we have the, the Sydney area in Australia, so it's almost exactly northwest. And it's not really that far. I think you might be uh, almost as far away as I am. I have to go almost due east. See, I have to just face the east. But I'm not facing the sun. <laughs> you know. But actually, if you want to do it straight, you can go right through the earth instead of going across the surface. <laughs> so you've got, uh, you'd have to face northeast and down maybe 30 degrees. <laughs> yeah. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're supposed yeah. to be facing Jerusalem when we pray, are we? Well, Daniel did it, and, and we, uh, you know, that's where he placed his name. But uh, we don't want to become, uh, you know, idolatrous. We're not facing an object. Yeah. We're facing where his name has been placed. You know, yeah. of course, not to regard his name and love his name. And yeah. we're always I'm just amazed by the mysteries of his name. Right? Not the mysteries, but the the, re the revelation of his name is what I really meant. Mm -hmm. It's not a mystery. It's it's actually very uh, very simple to understand. Yeah. I uh, Amy downloaded a, a fossil when we were up the coast. She downloaded a version of fossilized customs onto the onto the, the Kindle, onto the iPad, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I'm reading it. And I'm going, this this looks very different. And I'm looking at it, and it says sixth edition, and it's like. 15 years old or something and, I'm ah. just, and and of course there's lots of parts that aren't in, in the new one lots of chapters that aren't there and you've got YHWH in there all the way through it and I thought it's uh, it's amazing yeah it's amazing how things progress and one of the things that broke breaks my heart is the fact that even in the ninth edition I failed to upgrade one of the alphabets that I've got listed I think on the back of the book one of the um, I was I was still using the encyclopedic breakdown of what the letters represent and their equivalent letters, but I have found that I looked at that chart on the back of my book and I'm going, what? This isn't even correct. The uh, and the letter the letter that they call it wow or wow, we call it ua because it's a u, but in the Greek it says digamma, and that's not correct. I, that's what I got out of an encyclopedia, you know. Uh, some kind of a alphabet uh, listing, but really the letter uh, is epsilon in Greek. It's a U. See, the letter in, in uh, Paleo Hebrew was shaped like a Y in Paleo Hebrew. The sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Ua, shaped like a Y, and it went into the Greek the same shape. It's epsilon, and then the Latin it lost the stem. It just has this shape. But uh, people that are using the V sound are actually using an Ashkenazic pronunciation. I was listening to a gentleman on the internet uh, just a few days ago who was pronouncing his name Yehovah. You know, not knowing that the O U is actually a diphthong into Yahuwah. You know, mm. it's O U, yeah. but it isn't really an O. It's it, it, there's no O there. It's just a Greek corruption. Mm. And we talked about that. We have a, a whole new video on that. Yeah. yeah that By the way, those really wonderful. They, the ones that you sent over, people can order now. Yeah. 
uh, what's it called? It's called The Key of Knowledge. It's DVD 1 in the, we're starting a First Fruits basic foundational Torah teaching series. Lou and his flashcards. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm getting good at those flashcards. Yeah. Um, anyway, the, I guess it's been about an hour and 15 minutes. Did yeah. you want to go any further? Well, that's fine with me. Hey, everybody, did you know that Yahusha came to this earth and died on a torture stake so that you and I can have everlasting life? If you get immersed into his name you will be washed clean of all the filth of this world. All the guilt and shame will go and you can have a clean slate. The end of the world is almost upon us, but those in a loving covenant with Yahusha can have no fear because when the fire comes upon this world they will be kept safe. So what the hell are you waiting for? Aren't you sick and tired of this world, and its madness, all of the perverse mindsets, slaving away in a wicked system feeling like death? Come into Israel now before the door is shut and you burst into flames with the rest of this unrepentant world. This is Captain Netsori, saying repent for the reign of Yahuwah is at hand. Please please think about your life, and imagine being allowed to live forever. Shalom and bye bye. Talk, talk.